In Indian culture, we accidentally touch our feet. And, you know, we touch a book accidentally with our feet. What we do is that we touch the book with our hands and actually and put that hand back on our foreheads and do a pranam. I still remember my school days where I was waiting for the new books of the year to arrive. I still remember my mother diligently covering up each of those books with that newly bought brown paper. Right from my childhood, it has been reinforced in me that these rituals reinforce in me that books are to be respected. Books are precious. You know, I, if I go to a, a mall, if I go to a, a new city, I think the, the place that I love visiting is the book stalls in those places. And I still remember, 25 years back, I had nothing much to do on that afternoon, so I decided to go to my favorite bookstore in Mumbai. And since I had a long time, so I even took a stool and sat down on that stool to look at even the books that were, you know, at the bottommost layer of, of, of the, you know, the books, the, you know, the stall. And I saw one book that had sort of just fallen down there. And I picked that book up. I looked at the headline. And the headline said, Influence. The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert C. Aldini. I have not heard of this book before. Um, uh, you know, I obviously have not read of this particular book ever before. Uh, so, not even heard of it. But I said, oh, this is interesting. I picked up the book. I went back to my room. I read this 300-page book overnight. And this book changed the course of my life. Because for the first time, a book told me that if I had to understand human behavior, I need to understand the, human, the functioning of the human brain. Because that is where all our thoughts, all our act behaviors are being generated. This book also gave me a whole lot of practical examples of people who really understood intuitively the functioning of the human brain, how they've used that understanding to do a, a whole lot of persuasion strategies in the, in the streets around this country. And in my quest to understand further about the human brain. I picked up this book, Phantoms in the Brain, by V. S. Ramachandran, the head of neuroscience and psychology at the University of California, San Diego. And I started reading the preface of this particular book. And in the preface of the book, there's a question. Who invented telescope? <laughs> Even before reading the next sentence, I said, ah, I know the answer, Galileo. But the next sentence said, no, Galileo did not invent telescope. Telescope was invented in 1608 by Hans Lippehoy, a spectacle maker. And the next years after the invention, it was a huge hit across all the fairs in Europe. Because all the people stood in queues to see this new uh, you know, instrument that has been created, which could allow ships that are parked far away in the port much closer by. And Galileo heard of it. And Galileo told Lance Hippowai, can you make one for me? He did. And all that Galileo did was, he took that telescope and just changed the angle in which people have been using that so far. And when he started to turn the angle in which he looked through the telescope, he saw a world which was very different from what the world has seen so far. Just a profess of a book. Just a profess of a book told me that innovations are not about creating something new. It's all about just changing the angle in which you're looking at things. This book, of course, told me why the Nadraja statue is designed that particular way. 
why the fingers on our hands are the most sensitive part of the human body. This book, Descartes' Era by Antonio Damasio, is actually based on one of the most quoted uh, you know, case studies in medicine. 1848, Phoenix Gage was working on the rail tracks of railroads in America, close to New York. And an accidental blast, an iron rod went through his left eye and came out from the top of his head. He didn't die. But his behavior completely changed. Until then, Phoenix Gage was a very hardworking, brilliant worker. But after the accident, his behavior completely changed. And when he died, I think his skull was preserved. And now it's preserved in the Harvard Medical Museum. Antonio Damasio reconstructs the, the whole brain to find out what really happened in 1848 on that fateful day. And he also looked at a few other patients, 12 other patients, who lost exactly the same part of the brain, which is the men, ven, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And in all of them, Damasio found one peculiar similarity. All of them could actually analyze all the things very well, but, cannot, but could not take a final decision. And I think Damasio knew that ventral medial prefrontal cortex is actually involved in emotional processing. And based on it, this book concluded that one of the biggest constructs of Western philosophy, Cartesian philosophy, that mind and body are, are duels and rationality and emotion should never come together in decision making, he said is fundamentally wrong. Because all, all human decisions involve emotions. Once I started getting further into the world of neuroscience, this book, Gut Feelings by Gerd Gugrens or the Max Planck Institute, this book, John uh, Macron's Going Inside, this book, Incognito by David Eagleman, this book, Hidden Brain by Shankar Vedantam, gave me what I would call the biggest paradigm of a new knowledge that I ever received in my life so far. The paradigm shifting knowledge that I have ever got so far has come from these books. And what was that knowledge? That knowledge said 99.999% of the brain processes happen at a non-conscious level. And our consciousness, I have no way to reach out to them. Now this is a paradigm shifting knowledge. So much so, I think Shankar Vedantam in this book says, this new understanding of human behavior constitutes a revolution no less intriguing, perhaps far more powerful than the discovery that the sun really does not revolve around the earth. It's as paradigm shifting as an idea. These books that I learned took me to a very different facet of human behavior which helped me to pioneer the development of behavior architecture, a, a very unique way of trying to understand and persuade human behavior. The last few years, as I was trying to get into the world of artificial intelligence, this book, The Deep Learning Revolution by Terence Sevnowski, came my way. And as I started reading this book, I found something very interesting. We know this wave of artificial intelligence that we are all involved in started in the 90s based on data analytics. And Jeffrey Hinton, David Rummelhart, uh, Francis Crick, obviously Terence Sevnowski, these are some of the pioneers that has now led to the, this new revolution of what of artificial intelligence that you and I are seeing today. But there is something peculiar about the background of all these pioneers. They all had either psychology or neuroscience background. Now this book is now telling me the path 
to the future. Now it is telling me that the more we understand the inscrutable algorith algorithm between our years, better will be the technology we create for our machines. As I went far more deeper into the world of artificial intelligence, this book, The World Without Work by Daniel Susskind, this book frightens me. Now, this book says, whatever job that is being done today by the humans will be taken up by the machine. So much so towards the end, the last chapter, it says, it's, creating, it's going to create a huge philosophical or, I don't know, economic problem. And what is that problem? Because right now, the way the wealth is being divided is, you are doing certain work, you get certain amount of money, you are doing another work, and based on that, you get another salary. So today, the type of work we do is the way the wealth is being divided in the world. But if humans are not, all the humans are not going to do any work, and all the work is going to be done by the machine. How will we divide the wealth? I think when I, when, when I look at these books, I am realizing that, yes, there's a lot that it has helped me to build my career. But I also remember the first book that I picked up with my own money. It was the Holy Bible. I bought this book in 1978. Of course, it, it took me to some of the fundamental principles of one of the largest you know, religions in the world. And no doubt, a whole lot of that has actually become the foundation of the value system that I have been living so far. But this book also led me to read the holy books of other religions and read about more about other religions. I went to the Mahabharat and I realized the pragmatic approach the Mahabharat provides to life problems is very interesting. Nishkanda karma. You do your work and don't worry about the results. It's something that is an integral part of my value system. So when I'm looking at books, I realize even my moral foundation that I have today has come from the books that I read. My friends, my family, my parents, they all have influenced me. There are different events in my life that have influenced my life. But nothing has influenced me as much as the books that I've read so far. And, and the way these books influence me is pe peculiar, of course. These books provide me a lot of knowledge, no doubt. But these days, every time I pick up a book, more than the knowledge, it generates a lot of questions in my head. New And I want to find answers to those questions. And so I search for the next book that I can read so that I start getting answers to those particular books. I know... Each of you sitting in this audience will say, hey, I too have that intimate intellectual companionship with the books. I'm sure each of you would also say that what I am today is because of the books that I've read. Yes, what I am is because of the books that I've read so Thank you.